Now, seven years ago, when I started saying, we are going to go to the moon and we're going to mine for the resources. And people say, that's a freaking crazy idea. And when someone tells you it's a crazy idea, that means you're on the right path. Because dreams so big that people think you're absolutely crazy. And when you tell them what you're going to do, and if they don't think it's a crazy idea, you're not thinking big enough. So think big. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We have Naveen Jain in the house. My man, good to see you, brother. Good to see you, brother. I'm very glad you're here. We met uh, recently at an event in Toronto, yep. uh, which was a lot of fun. And um, I it was really the first time I got to be aware of more of what you do. I'd seen your face and I've heard your name before, but I really didn't know what you did. And then when I heard you're trying to go to the moon, I was like, who is this guy? Let me learn more. So you've got a business called Moon Express, right? Moonshot. Mm hmm Moon Express or Moonshot? Moon Express. Moon Express. And um, you're literally taking people to the moon. Is this right? Well, so yeah. So our goal really is to create the multiplanetary society because after all, we're all living in the same spacecraft called planet Earth. And whether we destroy it ourselves or we get hit by some large asteroid, we'll all become dinosaurs. And that's definitely something we don't want to do. Right. So you're looking to... What, what gave you the inspiration to try to go to the moon, though? Well, Was I, it... Yeah, so I really think a lot of the inspiration came from just growing up with a very humble background in India. We didn't have a lot of resources. We didn't have our days. We didn't have food to eat. We didn't have place to stay. And really looking up at the moon, it, gave, it was something about it that you could see and feel for a second that you are the richest man in the world because the richest man in the world cannot be looking at it any differently than you are. And it felt like you could be anybody you wanted to be. And to me, the going to the moon really was symbolic for me about what individuals and a small group of people are capable of doing. And so for me, it's obviously the, you know, going to the moon is an amazing business. So if I could rephrase John F. Kennedy, it will sound something like, we chose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, because it's a great business. And what makes it a great business is there are 16 quadrillion worth of minerals on the moon. What's really amazing about it is it is a planet, a celestial body that is almost like our eighth continent of the planet Earth. And once we can learn to live on the moon, and that is so close, and very same, similar types of problems as living on the Mars, we can next look at the whole space as our own backyard. We could be living on Europa and Titan and Mars and anywhere else. And to me, another way of looking at it is, what is it that people fight over? We, they, we fight over land, we fight over water, and we fight over energy. And if you look up, there's an abundance of land out there. There's an abundance of water and all the comets and all the asteroids. And you start to look and there's an abundance of energy. You know, our, you know, our solar system, even the planet Earth, even in our own galaxy, we are a tiny pale blue dot in our own galaxy. And there are trillions of these galaxies in this universe. And then there could be trillions of universes in this multiverse. So where is the scarcity? The scarcity comes from in our mind because we believe it's not possible. So we believe the only place we can live is this planet. And that's why everything that we value today, because they are scarce. But what if we can create abundance of food? We can create abundance of land. We can create abundance of energy. And we can create abundance of everything that we value. And people still say, well, humans are just greedy. It doesn't matter how much they have, they will want more. And then I remind them, you know, we are really not that bad people. Because when you look at air and you look at oxygen, we have learned to live together. We can all be in the same room and we never said, hey, Louis, you're taking my oxygen, move away. We don't because we inherently believe it is in abundance. And that mindset, if it's in abundance, we don't value it and we don't fight over it. Mm. And there is no doubt in my mind that we have access to these exponential technologies that can create these abundance of food, abundance of water. And we can, we can talk about that a little bit more. Wow. When was the first idea for you that you wanted to go to the moon? Was it when you were a kid where you're like, that'd be interesting one day? Yeah. It, you know, that was to me just the germination of an idea that what if that was possible? 
right? And then you obviously the man landed on the moon in 69 and that showed it was really possible. And then we since, you know, at that point we did that for political reasons. So moon we explored from both, uh, you know, reason we did that was primarily political, but then some scientific, but it has never been explored from the perspective of let's go somewhere where no one has gone before and let's stay somewhere where no one has stayed before, mm -hmm. right? So idea is not just to go there just to visit. What if that simply became the next Australia where we just right. lived there and we had the same type of connection that we have on other uh, continents and moon just simply became another continent and we'll have the same internet or let's call the intergalactic net. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> So how would you, I mean, you got to educate me because how would someone live on the moon? Well, so again, I mean, you know. You have to create a new atmosphere or would we all be living in bubbles or what? You know, so there, these are all of the things that every problem is simply an opportunity for someone to start thinking about creating a business around it, right? So you say, well, how can we live there? There is a tremendous amount of radiation, right? So radiation is a big problem. And at the same time, you start to look at the nature. The nature is an amazing innovator. So you find these bacterial organisms that are growing in the radioactive nuclear waste. You talk about radiation, that's the radiation, baby. Right. right? <laughs> and that radiation, what nature has figured out, not only how to survive in that radiation, it has figured out how to use the radiation as a source of energy. So now imagine if we can take the genetic material from these bacteria and use the CRISPR technology, which is genetic editing technology, for us as humans, and we suddenly, our genetic material is also the same as these bacteria, so that not only we are resistant from the radiation, we will, in the evening, we'll just be simply holding the hand with our honey and say, honey, do you want to go out and uh, take a walk and get some radiation, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> no longer going out for dinner anymore, right? Right, right. And that, to me, is just a thinking about the possibilities, mm. right? Now, seven years ago, when I started saying, we are going to go to the moon and we're going to mine for the resources. And people say, that's a freaking crazy idea. And when someone tells you it's a crazy idea, that means you're on the right path. Because dreams so big that people think you're absolutely crazy. And when you tell them what you're going to do, and if they don't think it's a crazy idea, you're not thinking big enough. So think big. And when and the reason is, when someone tells you it is impossible, it becomes impossible for them, not for you. And the more people who tell you it's impossible, that means more people have taken themselves out of the solution. And now the field is yours to on yours only, mm. right? And that's just a different way of looking at it. So when I look at as an entrepreneur, I don't focus on what the world is. I focus on what the world can be. So don't look at the glass being half empty or half full. You focus on saying, is this glass worth filling. Do I want to fill this glass or not? Because if I do, does it really matter is half empty or half full? And if I don't, does it re do I really care is half empty or half full, right? And that to me is really starting to think about every time you see something and you say, what is possible? What if and imagine are the two amazing words in the English dictionary. So when I say, Louis, imagine what happens is you all your preconceptions go away and you're willing to open to anything that I'm willing to say for at least the next 30 seconds of imagining. Mm -hmm. And then you may come back and say, oh, that will never work. Uh -huh. But at least you're open for that time. So, for example, when I started, uh, when I was finishing up my moon project, so just to let you know, we are the only company in the universe right now that has a permission to leave Earth orbit and land on the moon. Mm. Right. So even though everybody believes that Elon and Richard and Jeff, they're all going to the space, they actually so far, the only thing they're doing is in the suborbital space. They're still in the Earth orbit. Right. There's no company that has ever received a per private company that has ever received a permission to leave the Earth orbit. And we are the only company. In fact, wow. in 2015, President Obama signed into the law. It's called Space Resource Act that gives us the ownership of everything that we bring back, we have an ownership of that. Wow. So clarity of that law. Crazy. Crazy, isn't it? Right. Uh, and, you know, so as I was finishing this project, we are launching a mission to the moon in six months. So imagine, it's not like someday. Six months from now. Six months from now. You're launching a mission. To the moon. Launching a mission to the moon. How many people are going? Now, this is the first one. Obviously, the first one is going to be a robotic mission, yes. right? But the thing is, when we started the project, people thought it's going to be a billion-dollar venture, right? 
I was convinced that given the how fast the cost of these sensors and technology is coming down, it will be probably 100 million or less. It turns out I was, you know, I thought I was being 10x optimistic. It turns out actually I was 10x pessimistic. Mm. The cost is under $10 million. No way. Yeah, yeah. To so, send a rocket to the moon. Including the cost of the rocket. Wow. The whole lender and the rocket, the combined thing is going to cost under $10 million, right? And, that, and it's going to come back to? No. So first mission is one-way mission. And our second mission is going to be a return mission, wow. right? But, you know, the amazing thing is, imagine what you're just talking to me. You're starting to believe the mission of landing on the moon is already done. You're talking about... I, what are you, you know, when are you coming back? What are you going to bring back? And, you know, what is stuff out there? You're no longer even questioning that I'm going to right, land on right, the moon. Right. And that is the human mindset. Well, it's already been done, too. Yeah. So I believe that, hey, if it's been done before, of course it can be done again, right? Except it has never been done by a private company. Mm. And, you know, as a private company, you can't mobilize, you know, 20 million people to go out and call right. on the nation to say, here's $100 billion, sure, go sure. do it. <laughs> How much did it cost for us to go to the moon before? So uh, the cost in 1960 was $25 billion. Oh my God. And in today's dollars, that would be $100 billion, right? And so that would have been price prohibitive and from a business perspective would not have made sense, right? <laughs> right. right. But now it cost in the $10 million, it starts to make sense, oh, right? So bringing this stuff back, and obviously, you know, there is platinum grade material. There is helium three. There, you know, helium three is an amazingly clean energy fuel resource. That means you can use a small quantity of helium three in a fusion reactor, and you can power this planet for generations. No way. Yeah, yeah. And here's the thing: people say fusion reactor. Did you say fusion? Don't you know that we don't have a fusion reactor right now? And I say I do. But you, I don't have helium-3 either, right? <laughs> right? But the point is, in the next 10 years, when we are able to scale and start to bring helium-3, the technology will be there for fusion. And when these guys have a fusion reactor, they're going to be looking around and say, does anybody have helium-3? And that's when you say, yep, got some. <laughs> right? So my point is, wow. as an entrepreneur, your job is not to be where the puck is. You focus on where the puck is going to be. Of course. Right? Yeah, of and course. so you start to look at where the technology is headed and you start to plan for that. Mm. Right? Right? And even if you just brought the moon rocks back and you and I talked about that, right? That itself could uh, completely disrupt the diamond industry, right? Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. How much could you charge for that? And imagine, the diamonds are neither rare and nor were they ever a symbol of love and romance until in 50s when Marketing. the De Beers basically <laughs> marketed them as a symbol of love and romance, right? Mm -hmm. Moon has been a symbol of love and romance for centuries. All we have to do is when we bring the moon rocks, we make diamonds as commodity. And mm -hmm. the way you do that is simply to change the way people look at them. Wow. Everyone gives someone a diamond. If you love her enough, you give her the moon. Don't promise her the moon, you give her the moon. Wow. And the girl gets up and says, Louis, you're giving me a diamond, you're trying to buy me. I thought you loved me because if you loved me, you would have given me the moon. <laughs> right? And then honeymoon really becomes about taking your honey uh, to the moon. Wow. If you take honey to Hawaii, there'll be honey Hawaii, not honeymoon. Right, right, right. right. When are you guys going to start doing trips with, with uh, people? Anyone, yeah. you know, if yeah. I just wanted to buy a, a, a flight to the moon, what would yeah. that be? My gut check is in the next 10 years, I'm hoping the tickets will be so cheap, like $10,000 of a you know, ticket to the moon. And that's really when it start to become very affordable wow. for most people, at least to be able to say, you know, it's cost. It's a little more expensive than going to New York, yeah. but no more than going a first class ticket to say, uh, you know, um, Australia. Yeah, wow. <laughs> That'd be crazy. And how long do you think you'll, they'll stay for? You well, go for like a day, come back, or what would it be? It, some people are going to stay for there. There's no doubt in my mind the next 20 years, there's going to be a baby born on the moon. No way. Yeah, really. Wow. And then parents are going to be looking at this baby and saying, look up. We come from that planet. That's crazy. Right? Wouldn't that be crazy? Right? <laughs> right? Right? And that's just the beginning of the craziness. And if you continue to expand on the thought process of what entrepreneurs are capable of doing, right? So my feeling is that techno exponential technology is growing at such a pace that's allowing you and I and a small group of people to do things that could only be done by the large companies and the nation states. And as you and I were discussing earlier, now imagine, what is it that the nation states do? They 
they provide education, mm -hmm. health care, right? Uh, going to space, defense, all the stuff that used to be done by the government sector. What if the entrepreneurs can do this and do that better? So as you know, I started my another company called Wyom. Mm -hmm. And the goal there is really simple. What if we can create a world where chronic illness is a matter of choice? What if illness actually become optional? And people say, that's a freaking crazy idea. And you know you're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so uh, it, about a year ago when I said, we are going to make illness optional. That was a crazy idea at that time. And a year later, now we have not only the technology, but the people who are actually doing it, right? Mm. So a crazy idea that a day before a breakthrough is a crazy idea, the day after it's an obvious idea, sure, right? Sure, sure. So we have now, the you know, head of the Watson Research came and joined us to do the artificial intelligence to look at what's happening inside your body. Mm. Dr. Massier joined me to essentially understand how to interpret all this data. Dr. Yusevich, who was working at Los Alamos National Lab, it turns out they were working on a technology for biodefense work for national security. And the whole purpose was to know what is going on inside the human body. Right. So we took that technology, got exclusive license, put the team together, and now we launched the company where we are able to analyze everything in detail inside your body. Wow. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that, you know, not being a rocket scientist or not being a, a, doctor, a doctor, right? It still doesn't stop you from pushing the envelope and changing the way people do things, right? So, for example... Um, the reason we were able to do uh, our launch to the moon for so cheap is because we were thinking more like a software, guys. Mm. Don't build a big rocket, start to build a smaller rocket and build another thing on top of that that can go off and take to the moon. Just like the software programmers do, they build modules, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened in the medicine. Everybody is focused on therapeutics. You have Alzheimer. How do I build a drug for that? Right. You have Parkinson's. How do, how, how do I cure it? As opposed to how do I prevent it? That's exactly right. And it turns out, when, I know I read a lot, Louis. I read a lot of science journals. In the last five years, every single scientific journal is showing that we as humans are mostly microbial. So what surprised me as coming from outside was I didn't, I was told we're no, mostly what? Mostly microbes in our gut. Microbes, yeah. got it. So what happens is, I was told, you are your genes. Your, your yes. genetics are your destiny. If your father had this, your mother had yeah. this, you're more likely to more have likely it. More likely to have it. But it turns out it was so wrong. Our human DNA only produces 19,000 genes. The, the organisms in our gut produce anywhere between 5 million to 10 million genes. Wow. So think about that. We are 99% microbes, microbial genes, less than 1% human genes, right? Hmm. The research is so clear that every single chronic disease that we know of, Parkinson's starts in your gut, not in your brain. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just Google Parkinson's and microbiome, you'll see it. Alzheimer, autism, depression, anxiety, your behavior control, obesity, diabetes type 1, type 2, autoimmune diseases, all of your gut issues, every one of them have one thing in common, chronic inflammation, which is essentially caused by the imbalance of microbiome. Mm. So your microbiome, which is really these organisms in our gut, the nature created us as a symbiotic relationship with all other organisms. We can't do all the work ourselves. So they created this ecosystem. They digest our food. In turn, they release the nutrients. Mm -hmm. So when we eat fiber, our human body cannot digest fiber. It goes to these microbes. They eat the fiber and they release short-chain short -chain fatty acids. And that is what our body needs, right? They release the vitamins. They release all these things that we need. So if we don't feed them, they get unhappy mm -hmm. and, and they I, affect the rest of your body they ca cause cancer disease whatever exactly right? and what happens is when your guests are not at ease we become uneasy your guests is that what you said yeah yeah, yeah. those are your guests yeah, yeah. your guests are uneasy the host becomes uneasy right, right. and unease is called disease which is disease yeah right so you're basically disease is simply about your body not being at ease 
right? So what if you can understand what they're doing? What if we could tell you exactly what food and diet you need and nutrition you need and the supplements you need and just for you? And what I learned was there is no such thing as universal healthy diet. What's healthy for you is not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. What's healthy for me today may not be healthy for me three months from now. So you have to constantly really? change and adapt because what happens is when you change your diet, your body changes and your body adapts to it, right? Then you have to change it again. Otherwise, you always have imbalance. You keep feeding only one part of organisms, others start to die. So you have to constantly balance them. And this balance of the ecosystem is what keeps our body healthy, right? Wow. So imagine if we could do that, right? So we launched that company, what? three months ago now mm -hmm. and we have thousands of people who are already benefiting from it so to me it's just so satisfying that not coming from the medicine coming from outside the world able to rethink it and able to do something that could change the lives of billions of people around the earth earth so what is the success success is not about how much money you have in the bank success is simply about how many lives you've been able to impact positively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell our children all the time is that, you know, the best way you will ever know that you have become successful is the day you become humble. Because if you have an iota of arrogance left in you, that you're still trying to prove something to someone or yourself, that means you're not successful. Success comes from when you don't have to tell someone, you know who I am, right? Mm -hmm. You just be yourself, right? right? And you go out and do things that you care about. And what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that you're willing to die for and then you live for it? What if that was the, if you had everything in life, what would you do? And if you do that today, and that's how you constantly mm. focus and find your passion to do things that can yeah. change the world. Mm. When did you start to think this way? Were you, because you said you grew up in India. Um, when did you leave India? And were you always struggling financially growing up or yeah. How did it happen? So um, I came to the United States 35 years ago, and I had $5 in my pocket, barely spoke the language, right? And God has been very, very kind to us. I mean, any which way you look at it, I, you know, I every single day I feel we are so blessed. Um, this is my seventh company, and, you know, um, knock on wood, everything that I have done so far has been really, really successful. And to me, I am more focused on making an improvement in people's lives because the people who helped me become who I am don't need my help. And that is one of the worst feelings you can have is when you can't pay back the debt you have. You, ha you know there are people who helped you. You did not do it yourself. And you let you know, ask them, what can I do for you? And you say, nothing. Okay. <laughs> not and that's the worst feeling you get is that you have mm. all this obligation to the society what would you do? So if you can't pay back, you pay forward. And to me, um, that is really became who I am is constantly focus on how will, what can I do mm. that will change the lives of billions of people around the world. Mm -hmm. It's not about money anymore because, you know, and that's something that I try to tell a lot of young people who focus so much on making money, that making money is like having an orgasm. If you focus on it, you'll never get it. So if you just enjoy the process and do the things that you love, you'll automatically get what you're looking for. But right. just don't focus on it. Yeah, yeah. And when did you start thinking this way, though? Did you always have this mindset of anything is possible, that I can create anything I want, even when people say I'm crazy? Or did you start to see results in something and you're like, okay, maybe I can do this? So it's really, I cannot recall a singular moment that says, you know, this is where the change really happened. But or was there is, someone that like inspired yeah. you this way who thought differently? Or? So I think what happens is as you start to gradually start to go in that direction, you mm -hmm. start to surround yourself with the people who think similarly. Yeah. So to me, really is you become an average of the 10 people that you surround yourself with. And if you are a negative person, you tend to surround yourself with negative people, right? And the minute you start to think everything is possible, I can achieve any dream I set out to do. Amazing things happen. The people around you start to change, right? Yeah. And that's what I tell people. The first thing you need to do is get rid of everyone around you who laughs at your ambition and say, oh, you can't do that, Louis. You are nobody. Just look at yourself. How can you possibly think you could be reaching millions of people someday and you could tell them what you think? And they would have said, you are crazy, Louis. And you told them, 
that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. Right. Now you've started seven companies, is that what you said? Seven, yeah. Seven companies, and I'm assuming raised hundreds of millions with all these companies combined, right? You've, you've raised a lot. I don't raise a lot of money. So really? far, really, every company other than this company, last company, I rarely raise the money. It's really been a company became profitable very, right. very early. Right. In you the, bootstrapped it. And the, you. Yeah. And we bootstrap even this one. We bootstrap the company ourselves because, the, but the goal was so massive that if we could do this, and we really could find a way where people never have to be sick. Imagine what will happen. The whole healthcare system will just implode. Wow! And what's really happening, Louis, is that mm. any system once it becomes big, it becomes like an organism where the Darwinian theory starts to take hold. The pe- the survival of the system is what really matters and the purpose goes out the window, right? Yeah. So if you look at healthcare system, pharmaceutical companies really have become parasites on humanity. They don't really want you to be well. In fact- They won't make money. They won't will. make money. In fact, one of the CEO of the pharmaceutical company said, the best drug that we develop are the drugs that people have to take rest of their lives. So think about that mindset. If I can keep them sick is the best drug I develop. Right? That's not good. Right? That's not good. And all they do is they treat the symptom. They suppress the symptom. And when they suppress one symptom, they cause four more. So now they have four more drugs to oh, sell. Oh my right? gosh. So whole system has become so corrupt. You know, and that's the reason when I started this, I said, we're just not going to sell anything because people should be able to just find the food what they eat. Yeah. And if we just tell them what they need, the whole idea of these pharmaceutical companies, the doctors and the hospitals and insurance company, let the system implode. And then we'll save the trillions of dollars we're spending on this healthcare. The yeah. chronic diseases will just go away. Mm. And we, I am absolutely a firm believer. We actually can eliminate chronic diseases because they all happen. It, oh, by the way, they all happen in the last 100 years. Right? People who still live on the farm don't have allergies. They don't have autoimmune diseases. They don't get Alzheimer's because they are one with the nature. They get all exposure to all of the microbes from the chicken and the cow. And the more hygienic we're becoming, the more things we're living in the urban areas, more uh, you know, genetically modified foods we are eating, all of those things are killing the ecosystem inside us. Mm. We're taking antibiotics. Antibiotics are like throwing a nuclear bomb because you saw a bad guy. It obviously gets the bad guy, but it gets everyone. Yes. Wow. And when you kill the ecosystem, what happens? Suddenly your body cannot digest things. You suddenly are sick. So every time you take antibiotics, you literally are destroying your body. And then you have to rebuild that body again, right? And so idea is, what if we can prevent all of these chronic diseases from obesity to diabetes to depression to anxiety? I mean, these are... You know, anybody who had a family member suffer through them or even cancer. So there was a research that came out a couple of days ago from Cleveland Clinic Mm -hmm. where they found the breast cancer is caused by the microbes. And the cure for cancer, whether it's chemotherapy or immunotherapy, whether it works or does not work, can be predicted by simply looking at your gut. So the key is, remember your mother said probably, Louis, listen to your gut, do the gut check. She was the scientist, right? Mm-hmm, sure. These are the things. When you are an anxious, you see the butterfly in your stomach. You don't see a butterfly in your head, right? When you're depressed, what do you do? You eat. Right. Everything mm-hmm. goes back to the gut, right? The so point is, I believe that sooner or later, just like we changed our mind, but we used to believe the earth is the center and everything revolves around earth until we learn better. <laughs> I believe in the next five, 10 years, we're going to realize that gut is our primary brain and it pulls the string on the puppet that's on the top of our shoulder. Right, right, right exactly. And it just simply follows. Your gut decides what you crave, when you are hungry, when you are full, and your behavior. So behavior is, by the way, what's most surprising thing is controlled by the, the organisms in our gut. These microbes control our behavior. And people say, how can that possibly be? And I remind them, look, you know, when dogs get infected with rabies, what the first thing they start to do? They become aggressive and they bite. So these things change the behavior where dog becomes starting to bite. A good dog becomes a bad dog, right? Mm -hmm. So these microbes are the ones, and the way the mechanism works is, the recent research showed that, you know, even in our brain, the prefrontal cortex, they take over the communication mechanism called microRNA. 
and they start to manipulate the microRNA that changes the genetic expressions. So our microbes in our gut are controlling in our brain and the communication is happening back and forth uh, using the vagus nerve. And it mm -hmm. uses the neurotransmitter like cortisol and serotonin to go back and forth. Right. Most people may not realize 70% of serotonin is produced in our gut, not in our brain. So when you talk about feeling good, it's all in your gut. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by how you enroll people in your vision these crazy ideas that people think are crazy but then later they're like oh yeah that makes so much sense how do you get these overwhelmingly unrealistic concepts and infect these ideas in other people to say come with me whether invest with me you know obama sign an act with me whatever it is how do you enroll what's what's your so first thing really you have to do is believe in yourself that it can be done and people have to believe that with or without them it's going to get done it's happening it's happening this train is leaving the station so i you know when i started the first time and you know on the moon express i said people every time in your life you have had a chance to watch the history being made how often in your lifetime you get a chance to make the history. Mm. Come join me and we can make the history together. Or you can watch on the sideline while we make the history and you watch. <laughs> right. right? And that's, <laughs> no one wants to miss out. Nobody wants to miss that out. And another thing that I found really interesting is the bigger and the crazier the idea, the easier it is to execute. Really? Yeah. And here's the thing. So, for example... If I tell someone, hey, I'm going to build an iPhone app that's going to be able to f help you find a roommate, people say, good idea, great <laughs> idea, go do it, have fun with it. When I tell them, I'm going to start something that's going to make illness as an option, you start to get the best and the brightest from around the world because now you have created a big magnet. It attracts the people who want to make this their legacy. They want to work on the hard problem. They want to solve the problem that changes the way people live their lives, right? And when I did that, I was telling you, the head of the IBM Watson research called and said, I can build the AI for you. I've been doing it for 20 years. Wow. Just get me the data from inside the body and I can get the AI for you. Dr. Massier, PhD in microbiology, MD. She's working for Craig Venter, who was on the cover of Time magazine with the title, The Man Who Played God, working on in, you know, making the people live forever. Wow. She calls me and says, what's the point living longer? People are going to be sick. I love your vision. I'm going to quit my job and join you. Wow. Right? Dr. Yusevich found us because he said, I have the technology that looks inside your body. We did it for the national defense work. I think we can get that for you. Right. The point was that single goal of what is possible allowed me to bring these people together. And when you have these people together, what happens? Every single venture capital wants to be investing in that mm -hmm. because you have yeah. this amazing all team, yeah. all-star team with a um, vision that could change the way people live their life. What if I'm right? This is not a $10 billion company. It's not a $100 billion company. This is as you say, even the sky is not the limit, right? <laughs> <laughs> the moon is not the limit. The even yet. moon is the limit. Galaxy is not the limit. Even the universe is not the limit, right? Because it can be anything. It changes the way people live their lives. But the best thing is you did something that changed the lives of billions of people around the world. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that people want to be. Nobody joins the company saying, oh, I will make a lot of money. People do it because they say, Impact. I will... Yes. I'll have serious impact. And I remind people, unlike the olden days, people did good or people did well. That means people started non-profit or people started for profit. I really think the world had changed where people like you, Lewis, are changing the way people live. Mm -hmm. They're saying is, you can be great, but you don't have to be mean. You can, be, um, you can build amazing, great companies, not at the backs of people. And I really believe if you want to do the small good in the world, uh, you create a non-profit, right. right? If you do want to do a large good in the world, you create for profit because profit is the engine that drives you to scale, mm -hmm. right? So never ever think that what you're doing, if it makes money, somehow you are letting yourself down. You say, if I'm ever going to be doing great stuff in the world, it needs to have an engine for mm, profitability. Yeah, resources. You resources. can make more, make more money, right? Yeah, exactly. Even if you're the richest man in the world, 
and if you st- if you give away your money, it's only a matter of time before you run out of it's money. It's not generating new money. That's right. It's not generating resources. That's You're right. Constantly asking for more. That's right. Yeah. And that's the thing. Doing good and doing well is really the right philosophy, and that's the reason I love what you do. You. you allow people to be great. You allow them to create amazing ventures. They do great things, but doing it in the right way. Never sacrificing mm. your integrity and values yeah. to get something. Right. Knowing that what you have inside you is the most precious thing you have, your integrity. Never, ever give that up. Yeah, that's great, man. That's great. I appreciate that. Um, wow. And so what we talked last time was a few months ago. You said you're working on solving the world's biggest problems essentially right and that's what excites you yeah. things that seem like they can't be done you want to work on them you're working on going to the moon you're working on eliminating illness yeah. preventing illness yeah. is there other stuff you have in the future that you also want to work on yeah. or is there or is it or do you have too many ideas that you can't execute you know the few that are ahead of you that well, are already seeming impossible. Well, so interesting thing is, uh, you know, I spent seven years of my life on Moon Express. And now we are so close to the launch, I want to look at my next moonshot. So I did this healthcare. And I'm already starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. That in the next four or five years, we will have this problem under control. Once we get about a million people using Wyom, and... I, I don't know, Wyom, that's like V... we Viome. <laughs> Viome, right? How do you spell that? V-I-O-M-E? Yeah, is that right? that's it, V-I-O-M-E. And I, you know, as an Indian, I cannot pronounce that word V. <laughs> so I always like, is it Wyom? Is it Wyom? Wyom, whatever, right? So yeah, but V-I-O-M-E, right? So as I think we can solve that problem in the next uh, five years, and then I want to really f- um, solve the problem of education. Because I think the problem in the healthcare and the problem on education are very, very similar. Mm. Just like our healthcare system was designed to treat infectious diseases in acute care. And now we are suffering from chronic diseases. So it was designed for episodic uh, being sick. And now we are always sick, the chronic diseases. And that's why the system is falling apart. And the irony here is the cure for the infection antibiotics is largely responsible for many of the chronic diseases, right? If you look at the school system, same problem. It was designed to teach you skills. Today in the world of exponential technologies, skills are becoming obsolete every five to seven years. That means by the time you graduate, the skill that you learn may no, no longer be needed. Right. And that really creates this chronic unemployment. Hmm. Right. So now the school system, it's not that it's broken. It's not that it's not doing what it was supposed to do. It's doing exactly what it was supposed to do. But our needs today are very different than they were there. So you have to reimagine that school, the, the education system. How do you solve that? And that means now it's not about teaching you skills anymore because you have to assume Today, we have all the information in our hand using iPhone. That means we know every fact. I don't need to remember when Abraham Lincoln was born. (laughs) I simply remember the Google words. I need to Google the keyword to find that information. My memory no longer needs to be in my brain. I can outsource it on the cloud. That means all the phone numbers, all the information that I care about is already on the cloud. Even our decision-making like when I'm driving, I no longer use my brain. Mm-hmm. Google Maps tells me turn left. I turn left. It says make right, make a right. I don't think about it anymore, right? That means now our brain is constantly outsourcing the system. So our education system now has to say, okay, if you have all this information, how do you connect the dots? How do you solve the problem using inter disciplinary things Mm. how do you learn to learn how do you remain intellectually curious as we were talking about the things earlier we as humans the day we stop learning is the day we die and we become a zombie and there are a lot of people in you know you and i know who are just zombies they're not learning anything they're coasting through life right and you know and i see a lot of these people whether it's a teacher or an entrepreneur they get so frustrated they say i can only take you to the water i cannot make you drink and i keep reminding them i say step back for a second what if you made them thirsty and if you made them thirsty you don't have to ever worry about them finding the water and them drinking Mm -hmm. how do you make them thirsty intellectual curiosity if you start to show them what if this was possible 
What if you could do this? What if, how would you go about doing that? And that intellectual curiosity will drive them to constantly find the water, which is the knowledge. And constantly drinking is to constantly solve the problem because mm -hmm. now they have the knowledge, right? right? And that's the reason when I came to this healthcare, I was saying, I, I was reading and I start to look at the stuff and every research is shown, showing how microbiome is responsible for this, how microbiome is responsible for that. And those are all connecting dots until I said, I think we can make illness optional. Mm. Right? Same thing in education. What if there was no need for teachers? What if there was no need for hospital, uh, uh, school system? Just like what we're doing in healthcare. We are saying, why do you need the doctor? Why do you need the hospitals when you can empower each individual to become the CEO of their own health? What if I told you, Lewis, what is inside your body is not a black box. This is what's happening inside your body and here's what you can do about it. And you simply sign up and look at the information and you know what to do about it. You no longer have to be treated like mm -hmm. a black box or helpless victim. So when you call somebody a patient, or they're really calling them a victim, and you're saying, now listen to me, right? The sage on the stage is telling you mm -hmm. what to do. And the sage on the stage doesn't even know the basic signs. So when I go to the doctors and I talk about the microbes, they're not even taught in the medical school. I was interviewing a couple of doctors to join us uh, for the team. They don't know the basics of, I said, do you know the, how our gut works? Do you know these microbes? Do you know this thing called leaky gut? Do you know something about between the difference between DNA and RNA? He said, they don't teach us that medical mm. school. So think about that for a second. Yeah. You're getting an advice from someone who is at least 10 to 15 years behind the science. So science is coming up now is going to be 15 or 20 years before they teach them in medical school. And by the time you talk to a doctor who's gone through internship and practicing for a few years, you're 25 years behind where the science is, wow. right? And that's the reason why I believe time has come for us to go directly science to consumers. And that's the reason we started a company to bypass this whole healthcare system. Mm. What if we did the same thing for education system? What if we can go to every child and say, whatever you want to learn, you can get that on a smartphone in the way you learn. So today's school system yes. is backward. A teacher teaches a certain way. We learn differently. Some people learn experimentally. Some people learn conceptually. Some people learn graphically. We have to all adapt to the teacher's way. What if the other way around happened? Mm -hmm. What if the software adapted to how you learn? Wow. Right? What if software allowed you to learn things at your own pace, like a video game? You learn the level one and then you go to the level two. It doesn't matter whether it takes you three days or three years. You always go learn at your own pace. You learn to solve problems. You no longer are learning skills. You're learning all the resources that are at your disposal on Google. How would you apply them to solve this? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's a, just a different mindset. Mm. What would you say is the greatest lesson you've ever learned and who taught it to you? The greatest lesson to me really has been this idea of possibilities, the idea of dreaming big, an idea of never giving up. And I remember from the early days, my parents, uh, my mother was illiterate. My mother did not know how to read. And it's very interesting. I have vivid memories. I'm five years old. My mother sitting across me. And she wanted to make sure that we get out of the cycle of poverty. And she wanted me to learn. Where in India were you living? We had no place. We were moving from what village. What city or we region? Have, we moved from, in the northern India, we moved from village to village to village. And here's what happened, Louis, that my father uh, was an overseer and whose job was to build the buildings for the government. India is an extremely corrupt world. Yeah. And since he's working for the government, the yeah. government realized everybody's going to take a bribe anyway. So why pay them? My dad decided that he wants to be an honest man. And when you're an honest man, that means mm. now you're not taking bribe. And here's what happens. When the way the system works is that you tell the contractor, don't use the cement, use half cement, half sand. The building is going to fall apart in a few years, but you save the money, you give us a piece of it, he takes his part, gives the rest to his boss. His boss takes his piece, gives it to his boss, and then everybody in the food chain makes the good. Since I've, my dad was not taking money, his boss will call the contractor every six months. Hey, 
not getting any money. Is he keeping it all? He said, keeping it all. You know what he's asking me to do? What? He's asking me to build a building to the spec. Mm. I'm losing my shirt. I thought I would only use sand. And now he's asking me to use all semen. I'm losing my shirt. In government, you never get fired. You get transferred. Mm. Every six months, he will go from village to another village until we went to such remote villages. There was nothing to be built. <laughs> because he's, then he's not taking anybody's bribe. Right. They don't care if it doesn't work as long as he's not taking anybody's bribe away. Wow. Right? So most of our studies were done in places. There were no tables, no chairs. You wrote on the floor. My sister went on to become a postdoctorate in applied mathematics. Mm. My brother became, had a PhD in statistics. I am the least educated person in my family. Ended up doing engineering and MBA. And what the reason I'm saying is that when my mother, I didn't know she's illiterate. She's sitting in front of me saying, Tell me the answer to this problem. She will point it. And I say, Mom, the answer is seven. She say, don't make me look. Do it again. And I do it again and say, Mom, I think the answer is still seven. She say, good. Now go to the next one. I did not realize she couldn't even read. But she cared. Mm. That love and believing that I can get there. So the idea of never giving up. So you're asking me, what is the greatest lesson I learned? Was never giving up. Mm. Because as an entrepreneur, you only fail when you give up. An idea that you try may or may not work. And every idea that does not work is simply a stepping stone to a different idea and a bigger idea. Mm -hmm. So just never give up. I mm, love that. What about your father? What was the greatest lesson he taught you? Uh, integrity. I mean, he really taught me that it doesn't matter how tough life gets. You never, ever compromise who you are. You never give up your values. You never sacrifice integrity. And day in, day out, I say, there's nothing that I would do that will make my dad ever look back and uh -huh. say, what have you become? Right. That's great. That's great. Huh. Wow. This is fascinating. You're at loss for words. It literally <laughs> no, happens. I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm excited because I want to. I want people to feel like they have something that they could do right now. So I'm curious how do how do people cultivate this idea of innovation the way you have and the way you you've you know a lot of your friends have done, where maybe they feel like, well, I'm not sure, or I don't have those resources. Sure. So how could they get started in their life right now? Good. So I think you know one of the things is that about this constant learning. The good thing is you need, everything that you need to learn is already available on the internet. What I do is I, I get up very, very early. I get up at 4.30 in the morning and I spend the first three hours just learning about all the different technologies. Mm. So I will go read every science magazine, what's happening in the nanotechnology. I don't have to know a lot, but by learning every time. So initially what I did is I went to YouTubes and I learned the basic lectures about basics of nanotechnology, mm -hmm. the basics of neuroscience, the basics of artificial intelligence. And once you start to develop the vocabulary, then you can start to read more because they start to make more and more sense. So really just watching things like Singularity University where I'm on the board now, but at that time I was not. So I'm now on the board of Singularity University. I learn about every exponential technologies. I had all of our children go through the exponential technologies. And to me, when I look at myself and saying, what has been my biggest accomplishments? I really say that would be our children. I mean, uh, you know, to me, the best thing we did is allow these children to have the same ambition and same mm -hmm. hunger. I grew up poor and, you know, I would be lying if I said, you know, God has been so kind. You know, these children were growing up in an extremely affluent home. Mm -hmm. How do we still create the nurture, hunger, that feel, hunger desire, and, and yeah. desire and a passion? And I remember that, you know, having these conversations with our children um, and telling them that your self-worth is not from what you own. Your self-worth comes from what you create. And if you own a lot and you haven't done anything, you're still a worthless piece of shit in the, <laughs> when it comes to society. Exactly. You are a parasite on society. So don't ever be a parasite. Create something. Don't just own something, mm -hmm. right? And that to me is really the kind of thing. So, um, you know, just to brag about the children, I mean, how wonderful they come out. I have an oldest son who is 27. When he was 17 years old, he started something called Kairos Society, K-A-I-R-O-S. And now it's the world's largest college entrepreneurship thing, right? And you look at the stuff where they say, every single top CEO comes to help these mentors, from uh, these mm. uh, entrepreneurs from 140 countries 
they're all college entrepreneurs, mm. right? He started a company called Human, got acquired by Tinder, and now he's going and starting a second company. Wow. Daughter is 23, graduated from Stanford. She's a Stanford STEM fellow, Stanford Mayfield fellow. She's on the board of Stanford Women in Business, and she's a youth ambassador for United Nations. Wow. And our youngest one is a junior at Stanford, right? Amazing things. Our daughter was passionate about women empowerment. You know what she did? She worked, She's now in a company doing a women empowerment by actually removing all the bias in hiring. So it's a company called Pymetrix. They build the artificial mm. intelligence to remove the bias. And when they're working with companies at Unilever, the suddenly the more women and diversity and people are starting to get hired, right? Mm -hmm. So point is, the technology in itself is a tool to allow you to do what you actually care about. She cared right. about women empowerment. It wasn't about AI. Yeah. She's using the technology to deliver what she cares about. That's and great. that to me is really the key. What do you think is the greatest skill that every person should be learning and mastering? So the, there's one thing that we had to learn. Again, I'm going to go back to what I've said, intellectual curiosity, learning to learn, constantly finding this desire that you are always, every day when you go to bed, ask yourself, am I intellectually better today? Am I emotionally better today? Am I uh, spiritually better today? And if you're not, the next day you need to try twice as hard because every single day you got to be at least better in one of the three ways. In your mind, you've met a lot of great people, uh, You know, a lot of wealthy people, a lot of interesting, smart people. Who do you think is the most fascinating human alive right now? Well, you know, it's, it's such a difficult thing because I, you know, find in different areas, I just respect so many different people. Sure. I love Richard uh, Branson from perspective of his humility. Even though in a public persona, you comes across as a flamboyant person. In person, I would say he is introvert and his his humility is just unbelievable all right and you look at our you know our neighbors bill gates and jeb bezos they are just great great entrepreneurs you look up to them elon musk i mean you know he has been he has failed many times and he has done many things and he and i have been very similar industry for the almost the last 30 years right when he was running zip2 i was running infospace when he was running uh, mm -hmm. uh, x.com or paypal thing i was running the authorized.net and you know mm -hmm. he's doing spacex i'm doing moon express right but you look at him and every time i look and say you know what he's got man he's got a ball of steel so yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's just amazing to go out and do things that mm -hmm. he can do right so got tremendous admiration for them. So, I mean, you look at all of these people, it's hard to pick one. Yeah, yeah. If you could have a conversation with someone who's no longer here, who would that be? Someone from the past that you, well, never, that you never got to speak with. You know, there are so many people in the past Then you start to look at Marcus Aurelius, you mm -hmm. know, what a great philosopher he was, right? And you start to look at, to some extent, uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, and you look at, uh, uh, you know, many great people that have been on this planet Earth. I wish I could just uh, watch, uh, you know, watch them, what they were thinking when mm -hmm. they were doing Alexander the Great, what caused him to go you know, create this large empire. What was going through his head? It can't be the land, the conqueror, the land. Mm -hmm. What was going through his mind, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, what really I find most fascinating is how people think, not what people do, right? And I think you and I had a brief conversation earlier about that everyone wants to know about the seven habits off, right? Mm -hmm. And I always thought that's such a dumb thing to always do, right? Why would you want to follow the rituals and the habits of someone you want to follow their thought process right because rituals don't make you them their thought process makes you them so for example tony robbins takes ice bath every morning you can take your ice bath three times a day not going to make you tony robbins right, right, right? Yeah, exactly. what's going to make you tony robbins is to think like tony robbins mm -hmm. right and that's the reason i love the idea of people following the thought process of these people who have just done amazing things in their mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. What do you dream about then? I dream about every single day what other problems I could be doing. Am I really giving it my best to the thing, the society back? Have I really given enough back than what I have taken? Yeah. Because to me, this obligation to give back is so strong because I feel I don't want to die with that debt on my head. Right. Wow. What's missing in your life? 
you know, at this point, I just feel that there's so much to do. The time is the only thing that's missing in my life. That You know, I work 80, 19 hour days, seven days a week, and I just wish I could just do twice as much, right. and, you know, and... And so, yes, I try my best to build the best team around me so we can leverage a lot of that. But I just wish somebody could mm. give me more time. Mm. Maybe that's the next challenge. Yeah. Maybe that's the next... Uh, Stop time? <laughs> yeah, expand time, something. I don't yeah. know. That'd be interesting. Um, cool. I want to ask a final few questions. Yeah. This has been fascinating. And um, for people that are interested in, you know... Ending any illness yes. or preventing it, where can they go to learn more about Viome? Is it Viome.com yes. or how do they? Yes. V-I-O-M-E.com. And we'll have links up for this afterwards and tell you guys where to go to get all that. That is correct. And you can, in fact, you know, the thing, this technology used to cost thousands, three to $5,000. We brought it down to $399. Right. And and once you do one test, you can do as many tests as you want during the year for $199. Wow. So we're really trying to make sure that everybody can get to the things. And I know it's still a lot, but my hope is that as people start to come on board, price will continue to come down. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, Viome.com, so make sure to check that out. Final few questions. Uh, this is called the three truths. Yes. Three truths. So imagine this is the last day for you many years from now. Yes. And it's... Life's over. You haven't been able to expand it past 200 years. Yes. So it's another 100 something years from now. 150. 150 <laughs> years. Uh, and everything you've created, you've solved so many of the world's problems. You've, there's uh, skyscrapers on the moon. You're going off to Mars now. You're doing whatever you want. Any dream you've had, it's happening mm -hmm. or it's happened. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, um, all the things you've ever said, all the things you've talked about, your speeches, they're erased from time. Mm -hmm. So no one has your information anymore. Mm -hmm. And you have a piece of paper and a pen, and you get to write down the three things you know to be true about yeah. all your experiences in life. The three things, three truths that you would share with the world. The lessons. Mm -hmm. What would be those three truths for you? Uh, always be who you are. Don't let someone mold you to think you want to fit into the society. So never give up your identity uh, to fit into the society. Always know, uh, be stay crazy because the crazy is who change the world. It's never in the middle of the pack that will ever change the world. And the third thing is never stop learning because the day you stop learning, you have essentially have, you died. Right? So those are the three basic through intellectual curiosity, dreaming big, and being true to yourself, the integrity. Mm, mm, I love that. Um, where can people connect with you personally? Online? I am uh, on a social media. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. Or you can send me an email. I'm my first name dot last name at gmail.com. So that's naveen.jn at gmail.com. Okay, perfect. Awesome. And viome.com. Make sure you guys check that out. Um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you, Naveen, for your incredible ability to dream and to think so big and to dream about not just what's in it for you, but what's in it for humanity and the world. You know, you're constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible and you're attracting the best of the best to help solve these problems so that we don't have to suffer anymore. So I acknowledge you for your ability to be crazy, to continue to learn and to give back. Uh, and not just make it all about you. So I thank you for that. I want to acknowledge yeah. you, Louis, for doing what you do to allow everyone's dream to be coming through and to be able to share these ideas mm. with uh, your community and your tribe. All I can say is thank you very much for uh, you know dedicating your life mm -hmm. to spreading the magic of greatness. And um, and I can tell you from my side, there is no better school of greatness than to be talking to great people around the world. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, final question is, what is your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness really is someone who is able to find happiness inside them. Because there is, as long as you're looking for that happiness in the outside world, you'll always be chasing the mirage. You'll never find it. The happiness comes from inside. That means able to be at peace with yourself is the best greatness you can ever have. Mm, Naveen, my man. Appreciate you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, brother.